In chapter 10, we will talk about the different strategies that firms with market power can price their product. The pricing strategies are very interesting and uh, give you a deeper understanding of the consumer decisions and managerial decisions. Our first topic is so-called price discrimination. Price discrimination just means that as long as you can identify different customer groups and uh, they cannot resell the product you sold them to other groups, then you can charge different price on different types of customers. Here in this first example, the problem we are examining is why price discrimination can make more money or say improve the profit for the firms with market power. There are actually two reasons. One is that the firm can get more money from consumers with higher willingness to pay, basically charging those customers who would like to pay higher price, the higher price. And then the second way is to bring in more sales from the lower price charged to the customers who have lower willingness to pay. With the higher price, you will exclude the consumers who would like to pay less for your product. But if you can identify those consumers and Given them a low price, you can actually sell more of your product. The basic assumption in this story is actually that the marginal cost is close to zero or equal to zero. Especially here, if you think about a movie theater, if the movie theater is not filled, the marginal cost is zero to admit another customer for showing. So that's why you sometimes find early afternoon or say Monday morning movies, if the movie theater ever open on Monday morning, the price is cheaper. The very low marginal cost guarantees that the low willingness to pay customers, when you give them the low price, you can still make money on them. You don't just lose money on the low price you receive. So. Let's look at this question. We assume that there's college students who has higher willingness to pay, and they will pay $20 for a movie ticket. And then there are senior citizens who have lower willingness to pay, and they only pay $10 for a movie ticket. In panel A, we have 10 college students and 20 senior citizens. That is the customer base for this movie theater. And then let's think about two different uniform prices. Movie theater just charge one price to all the customers. If the price is set at $10, the college student will certainly buy the tickets because their willingness to pay is $20. And the senior citizens, they would like to pay $10 for a ticket, and they get $10. So both will buy the tickets. The movie theater receive $100 from the students and $200 because there are 20 senior citizens. Each pay $10, $200 from the seniors. You add up, the movie theater has $300 in revenue. Again, if we assume there's zero cost, all costs are sunk. For the movie theater, this is just their short-term profit. Or say, basically, we assume there's zero cost for the movie theater. And then if you look at uniform pricing with $20 per ticket, now only the college students would buy the tickets. You excluded the senior citizens. They only would like to pay $10 per ticket and the movie theater manager charged them $20 per ticket, they won't come. So the total revenue now for the movie theater is $200, which is lower than $300. Now, what we have achieved with 
this particular customer base, ten college students and twenty senior citizens, a lower uniform price, give you better profit because basically the、uh, lower price bring you a large customer base. The senior citizens they are the dominant customer base. Then that ten dollars is the profit maximizing price. However, if you can identify different consumer groups, now you want the senior citizens show their driver's license to say they are actually the seniors, and then you say, okay, if you are senior, I charge you ten dollars. Now what can happen? We still charge the college students twenty dollars, but we give the seniors a discount of ten dollars. So. The idea is still that it is hard for the college students to pretend to be senior citizens, especially just from their looks. Okay, now from the ten college students, we can charge them twenty dollars per ticket. We receive two hundred dollars, and from the senior citizens, we charge them ten dollars per ticket. We receive two hundred dollars. The total profit is four hundred dollars. The point here is that because now you can price discriminate the actually you want to say the college students, right? You actually indeed charge the college students higher prices, and、uh, you extract more consumer surplus from these college students, and that give you higher profit. This is basically charging. The high willingness to pay group a higher price when you can price discriminate, then you bring in more revenue or bring in more profit, and the money come from transferring the consumer surplus to the producer. Now let's look at panel B. The proportion of senior citizens dropped. From twenty to five, now you have a lot less senior citizens. You're in the customer base for this movie theater. So, if we again charge ten dollars to all the customers, ten college students bring in one hundred dollars. The five senior citizens bring in fifty dollars. We got one hundred and fifty dollars in profit. Now, if we raise the uniform price or the single price to twenty dollars per ticket, from the college students we receive two hundred dollars, and from the senior citizens we receive nothing, zero, because their willingness to pay is just ten dollars. They won't buy a twenty dollar ticket. The total profit is just two hundred dollars. However, because there are much less senior citizens, when you lose their Spending, right? They no longer spend money with the movie theater. It actually doesn't hurt. The low uniform price hurt the profit because they charge low price on the high willingness to pay consumer group. They charge a very low price on the college students. They can make two hundred dollars on them, but they only make one hundred dollar on them, and. There are extra five customers you can bring in from the senior citizen group, but that's only fifty dollars. Doesn't really compensate for the one hundred dollar loss by charging a low price on the college students. So, if again we can discriminate the customers, still we give senior citizens a ten dollar discount, then. They pay this fifty dollars to come in, and that still improve the profit from two hundred dollars of the uniform price, twenty dollars per ticket, to two fifty when you charge the college students the full price and give a senior discount to the senior citizens. So in this example, the actual profit come from. Charging lower price to the low willingness to pay consumer group, and bring in additional revenue. The key here is actually there's no marginal cost. 
zero cost for the movie theater to bring in more customers, right? More people to watch the movie, and their expenditure is pure profit. So let me summarize. There are two sources that can contribute to the improved profit after a firm can price discriminate. One is to charge the high willingness to pay group the higher price, and that bring in more revenue from transfer consumer surplus to the firm with monopoly power. And then the second source is that when you can charge lower price on the low willingness to pay group, you can generate additional revenue. And to make that new deal profitable, the condition is actually you have zero marginal cost or very low marginal cost. In figure 10.1, we examine the so-called perfect price discrimination, which is also called the first degree price discrimination. A firm with market power that knows exactly how much each customer is willing to pay for each unit of its good, and the firm can prevent a resale, then this firm can charge each person his or her reservation price. The concept of the reservation price is the maximum amount a person is willing to pay for a unit of the product. The assumption for perfect price discrimination or the first degree price discrimination is quite unrealistic. It assumes that this firm with market power knows the reservation price for every customer for every unit. So when we look at this demand curve, a very simple assumption we can specify is that each customer only need one unit of the product. And then the firm knows what is the reservation price that customer would like to pay for the unit of the product. Another way to think about this is actually assume this demand curve is for one customer. And then for each unit, we know the so-called marginal reservation price, the reservation price the customer would like to pay for the next unit. And basically what we are saying is that the firm knows the complete demand curve information for this customer. So that's the assumption for first degree price discrimination. What we are saying is that because the firm knows the demand curve of this customer or knows the reservation price for the only unit each customer need, then the firm charge exactly the reservation price for that customer. And it's very important that customer cannot resell it. The situation we are trying to prevent is the customer who has paid $4 may try to resell this unit to the customer who would like to pay $6. So as long as the firm knows all the reservation price information and resale is impossible or say the firm can prevent reselling, then the firm can perform the so-called perfect price discrimination or first degree price discrimination. Here what's going on is that, again, let's assume each customer only need one unit of the product and the firm knows that one customer would like to pay $6 for it, the other would like to pay $5 for it, the third one would like to pay $4 for it, and there's the third one who would like to pay $3 for the unit of the product he or her needs. Now, on the first unit, the firm charge $6 to the first customer and receive marginal revenue of $6. The marginal cost is $3 for all the units produced. Then on the first unit, 
the uh, firm can receive a producer surplus of three dollars six minus three on the second unit the firm charged five dollars to that customer and uh, the marginal cost is three dollars so there's two dollars consumer surplus on the second unit on the third unit the firm charged four dollars to that customer basically you can imagine that the customer have a reservation price displayed on the forehead of that customer and uh, the firm sees that oh four dollars you would like to pay four dollars uh, we will charge you four dollars then there's one dollar in consumer surplus transferred from the consumer to the producer here marginal profit is one dollar the fourth unit the fourth customer only would like to pay three dollars and uh, because that covers the marginal cost we assume the firm just sell at three dollars to the fourth customer so now if we add up all the producer surplus here is three plus two plus one it's totally six dollars in producer surplus the total revenue is actually six plus five plus four and plus three and that equals eighteen dollars that's the total revenue so the area below the demand curve this complete area this complete area below the demand curve is the total revenue the area below the demand curve and above the marginal cost curve is the producer surplus and here in perfect price discrimination what we are looking at is that the firm with market power completely extract all the consumer surplus from every single customer because one it knows it knows the reservation price for every single customer two it has market power it can price the product according to its own policy it can set the market price for each different customer a very interesting conclusion here is that with perfect price discrimination we actually achieve economic efficiency we maximized the total surplus because we actually get the last unit sold the price equal to the marginal cost even though all this consumer surplus if we have a competitive market the six dollars here below the demand curve and above the marginal cost curve will be consumer surplus all this consumer surplus transferred to producers the point is that they are not lost they are not the debt with loss they actually realized in the economy it's just distributed differently in this market the maximum possible total surplus actually realized so this is not a very intuitive situation but the fact is that this is an efficient outcome with perfect price discrimination we actually achieved an efficient outcome in figure 10.2 we are looking at a comparison between competitive market outcome uh, uniform pricing single price for a monopolist and perfect price discrimination in perfect competition what we have is that the price the market price is the marginal revenue for a firm in the competitive market and uh, a b c will be the consumer surplus d and e are the producer surplus the total surplus is a b c d e this whole area between the demand curve and then the marginal cost curve up until the competitive equilibrium quantity so that's the total surplus in competitive market in single price monopoly pricing we will lost c and e the consumer surplus shrink to a part of the consumer surplus b transferred to the producer become a producer surplus and when the price is ps here the 
producer supplies is B and D. That's where the monopolist marginal revenue curve meet the marginal cost curve. And there's C and E debt with loss. The C part is the consumer surplus loss, and E part is the producer surplus loss. The reason is that when the monopolist lower the price, the marginal revenue is so low that it fall below the marginal cost. This lower price will bring in higher quantity sold, but also bring down the price sold on the quantity already selling in the market. So there will be debt with the loss. But if the monopolist can perform perfect price discrimination, every consumer, every customer has their reservation price printed on their forehead, and then the total surplus will be A, B, C, D, E. The point is that compared to competitive equilibrium, part A, B, C, this consumer surplus now is totally transferred to the firm with market power, or say in this case, the monopoly in the market. The total surplus equals producer surplus. The consumer surplus is zero. So in both competitive markets, or say perfect competition and perfect price discrimination, the total surplus realized is the highest. In uniform pricing for a monopoly firm, there will be debt with loss. But the consumer surplus is highest in perfect competition, lower in uniform pricing, and lowest zero in perfect price discrimination. The next form of price discrimination is the so-called group price discrimination. It is also called the third degree price discrimination. In essence, when the monopoly can separate its customers into different groups and prevent each group, especially the group that received the lower price, from reselling the goods or products to the group that has to pay a higher price, as long as that separation and the prevention of reselling is possible, the monopoly can treat the different groups as different markets and then just treat each market as a isolated market and set a uniform monopoly price in that particular market. Again, the basic assumption is that once you set the price for a particular market, the buyers in the lower priced market won't be able to sell the products into the higher priced market. Here in our example, the product is the Harry Potter DVD, and the two different markets are the United States and the United Kingdom. The reason that resale is prevented between the two markets is for one, the formats of the DVD are different in the two countries, but we know that is very easy to resolve if you have a old format DVD player. But in reality, I think shipping cost can be another good reason, at least preventing individual copies to be shipped across the Atlantic Ocean. But still, you can pack a lot of DVDs into one box and make the per unit shipping cost cheaper. Actually, this kind of different price in different country practice is very common in textbooks. A few years ago, a US judge has ruled that selling, say, the Indian version of the same textbook in the US market is actually legal. So they at least try to mess up the table of contents so that if you bought a soft cover Asian market copy of the same textbook, it will be hard for you to find the right content if your professor is using a US version and point the uh, question in the textbook according to the US 
textbook pages. Anyway, that's how they try to prevent reselling from two different countries. But in this case, let's assume the reselling is prevented effectively. Then the marginal cost for producing one DVD is just $1 for Warner Brothers. The monopolist simply set where this $1 marginal cost meet the marginal revenue in each market. In the US market, the quantity is 5.8 million and uh, the corresponding price is $29. In the UK market, the quantity is 2 million and uh, the price is $39. In either country, this is simply a practice of monopoly uniform pricing, making the marginal revenue equal to the marginal cost in that particular country. And in each country, there is deadweight loss for both countries. In general, if you cannot prevent reselling between two different markets, and the monopoly still try to set just one uniform price, where the marginal cost equal to the marginal revenue, the monopoly price will be somewhere between the two different prices. Again, when you have just one price for two different markets, you can no longer charge a higher price for the group of consumers with a higher reservation price. And uh, you cannot charge a lower price for the consumers in the group that have lower reservation price and increase the sales, right? If you increase the price in the US market here, what is gonna happen is that you will lose some sales. So that's why in this situation, profit is maximized when the monopoly can charge different prices in different countries or say to different groups of consumers. The calculus solution for third degree price discrimination or the group price discrimination is straightforward. The reason is that we can simply treat the two market separately. There is a plus sign here. You add up the American market profit and the British market profit together. That's the total profit for this firm, or say for Warner Brothers. But the quantity sold in the two different market does not enter the other market. So each market's profit only depends on the quantity sold in that market. Then to maximize this profit function, we simply differentiate the total profit with respect to the two different quantities. And basically when we differentiate with respect to one quantity, say QA here, uh, we assume that QB is a constant. So that part of the equation actually doesn't matter. Then we set the first order derivative with respect to the quantity to zero for each market then we will be able to find the profit maximizing quantity for each market. That profit maximizing quantity in each market will determine the price the monopolist will charge in each market. Here for the US market, we differentiate the total profit function with respect to the quantity sold in American market and set that to zero, we get the marginal revenue in the US market equal to little m, the marginal cost. For the British market, again, we differentiate this total uh, profit function with respect to the quantity sold in Britain and um, set this first order derivative to zero. We get the marginal revenue in Britain equal to the marginal cost m again. Solving MR American equal to M and MR British equal to M 
these two equations separately, we will get a solution for QA star and the QB star. It's basically the profit maximizing quantity that the monopoly will supply to the two different markets. And those two quantities will determine the price in the two markets. From our previous calculation, we have seen that because the monopoly has a single number, little m, for its marginal cost, the marginal revenue in the American market and the British market indeed has the same value, the marginal cost, little m. So that's what we have obtained from the profit maximization decision by the monopoly using group price discrimination. And from chapter 9, we have this expression for the marginal revenue. The marginal revenue equal to the price times 1 plus the inverse of the price elasticity of demand. Remember, the elasticity of demand is actually a negative number. It means the marginal revenue is below the price, 1 minus something times P. So it will be smaller than P. It means the marginal revenue is less than the price. But this equation is true for all the marginal revenue price relationship. So for marginal revenue in the American market, it equals to the US price times 1 plus the inverse of the US elasticity of demand equal to the marginal cost we have obtained from the profit maximization decision using a third degree price discrimination. This whole equation equal to the marginal revenue in the British market equal to the British price times one plus the inverse of the elasticity of British demand. Now, once we get this equation, we have an expression about the price, kind of ratio between the two prices using the elasticity of demand. Let's think about a situation where the elasticity of demand in British market is lower. So it's a smaller negative number, epsilon B, than epsilon A. If epsilon B is a smaller number, this ratio will be a bigger number. It will be 1 minus a bigger number. And in the numerator, it will be 1 minus a smaller number. The result is that the numerator will be higher than the denominator. So when epsilon B, the elasticity of demand in British market is declining, the ratio between the British price and the American price will become higher and higher. And that's actually the situation here. The textbook gives us an estimate of the elasticity of demand in British market is minus 1.0263. And for the US market, the elasticity is minus 1.0357. So the British demand is less elastic. And when that is the case, we do see a higher price in the British market. The British consumers actually pay 34% more than the U.S. consumers. PB over PA is $39 over $29, equal to 1.345. So it's a ratio that is higher than 1, saying the British price is higher.